Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Kenneth Bianchi. The Hillside Strangler, which was later found out to be a pair of cousins working together, were Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Buono Jr. The two were charged and convicted for harming and taking the lives of 10 separate women together, with Kenneth taking the lives of two others on his own. After an extremely intensive investigation and the arrest of the two, Kenneth began trying to set up an insanity defense. He claimed disassociative identity disorder. He blamed his alter ego Steve for the horrific multitude of crimes. Luckily, however, a court psychologist, Dr. Martin Orn, observed him in his behavior and found that his claims were untrue. After being presented with this finding, Kenneth agreed to plead guilty and testify against his cousin in exchange for leniency on his sentence. He still ended up being sentenced to life in prison, while his cousin got a sentence of life in prison without parole. While Angelo had a heart attack and passed in 2002, Kenneth still remains in prison. In our number 9 spot today, we have Warren Jeffs. Warren Jeffs is the president of the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ and the Latter-day Saints, and is also serving a life plus 20 year sentence, which is exactly where he should be. His father was once the president of the but when he passed, the position was passed on to Warren. As the new leader of the polygamous he said that no one should even attempt to marry one of his father's widows, but just a few days later he himself married all of them except for two, because one refused and then was banned from ever marrying anyone ever again, and the other ran away. If your marriage proposal causes someone to flee the that they're in, you're clearly not a very good person. Warren had the power to assign who would marry who, but he was also able to punish a man by taking his wives and children and assigning them to another man. As a man, you had to have at least three wives in order to get into heaven, they say, but the more wives, the more likely it would be that you got into heaven. In 2005, the Texas authorities conducted a raid and took legal custody of 416 children after someone called in and tipped them off about all of the horrible things that were happening happening at the ranch. In 2006, Warren was arrested for being the worst and is still serving his sentence. There is so much more to this case that we don't have time to cover, but there was a documentary released recently called Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey, which I would fully recommend if you want to know more about this horrible person. In our number 8 spot today, we have Tex Watson. Tex Watson was one of the central members of the Manson family, which was led by Charles Manson, and he was a willing participant for the horrible Tate and LaBianca crimes that took place on August 9th and 10th, 1969. If you don't know about them, you can look them up, but just a warning that the events that took place on those nights were horrible, gruesome, and insanely unnecessary. In October of 1969, Tex knew his arrest was coming, so he fled to his home state of Texas, but was later arrested and extradited back to California. Once he was in California, he refused to talk or eat and ended up losing 55 pounds, which got him sent to get tested to see if he was fit to stand trial which he was. In 1971, he was convicted on seven counts related to the killings that happened on those terrible nights. He originally received a death sentence, but it did end up being commuted to life in prison. But get this, you guys, he was able to release a book while in prison, and he got married, and through conjugal visits, he was able to have four children. Thankfully, in 1996, they banned those kinds of visits for people serving life in prison, and in 2003, he did get divorced because his wife had met someone else, which, like, yeah, I would hope so. He also apparently is now a devout Christian, which... It's just interesting. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Golden State Killer. If you have any interest in true crime at all, you have most definitely heard of the Golden State Killer, as he was one of the most famous serial killers of all time, and he managed to elude police for 30 years. From 1973 to 1986, the GSK was responsible for taking the lives of 13 people, harming 50, and 120 different burglaries all across California. Throughout the investigation process, he used different tactics to both taunt and and threaten police and victims, which is just on another level of messed up. If you don't know how this story ends, buckle up because it is absolutely wild. So you know those family DNA tests, like those 23andMe things where you send in your DNA and then they send you back your genealogy? Well, basically these services helped identify who the real GSK was. In 2018, when Detective Paul Holes, shout out to MFM if you know you know, and FBI lawyer Steve Kramer uploaded the GSK DNA profile that they were able to obtain from the crime scenes to the website GED Map. 
match, they were able to find 10 to 20 people who had the same great 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 grandparents as the match. From there, a genealogist made a large family tree, and then they were able to single out two main suspects. After covertly connecting DNA samples from one of the suspects and comparing them to the crime scene DNA, they were finally able to arrest Joseph James D'Angelo, who is the Golden State Killer. After decades of waiting, the victims of his crimes were finally able to see justice served as he was sentenced to 12 life sentences plus 8 years. He was spared the death penalty because he admitted to numerous crimes he had perpetrated, some of which he wasn't even being charged for. He is now 75 years old and he will most certainly spend the rest of his life in prison. In our number 6 spot today we have James Holmes. James is the man behind the 2012 Aurora, Colorado shooting that took the lives of 12 people and injured 70 others in the Century 16 movie theater. Shortly after the crime spree, he was arrested and held without bail while he awaited trial on an accepted plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. I just want to make it clear in this case that insanity doesn't apply to every mental illness, of course. James was and is severely mentally ill, but the court has the job of deciding whether or not that illness made him unable to tell right from wrong. That's what the defense had to prove. Things were admitted to the court, such as his notebooks and journals, as well as testimony from two separate psychologists who spent 22 and 25 hours with him, and both diagnosed him with a serious mental illness, but both also stated that in their professional opinion, he knew right from wrong. After a really tumultuous trial, he ended up being found guilty. The jury could have given him a death sentence, but on account of his illness, they decided that that would be inappropriate. So in the end, instead, he was sentenced to 12 life sentences without parole and in an additional 3,318 years. In our number 5 spot today, we have Charles Ng. Charles' story really starts off shortly after he moved to the United States on a student visa. He dropped out after his first semester and soon after he was involved in a hit and run accident. He then tried to avoid prosecution by enlisting in the United States Marine Corps using false documents that stated his birthplace was within the United States. He was later arrested by military police a year later for stealing automatic weapons and then somehow he escaped custody, headed back toward Northern California and this is where he met Leonard Lake who is another real piece of work. Charles did end up going away and serving a bit of time but it was only 18 months and he was back with Leonard and that is when the two started their crime spree together. It is believed that together the pair took the lives of somewhere from 11 to 25 different people. When Leonard was caught and brought in for questioning, he sneakily took a cyanide pill he had hidden in his jacket and took his own life, but Charles ended up standing trial. He was convicted for 11 of the killings and he remains on death row at San Quentin. In our number 4 spot today we have Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. This is a double whammy because unfortunately both of these people are still alive, but at least one of them, Paul is still in jail. This horrible pair are often referred to as the Ken and Barbie killers, and while Paul started off living a life of crime, he quickly brought Carla into it as well after their meeting. That is not to say she is not just as guilty as him, however, because they are both fully responsible for their own actions. While Paul was arrested for a multitude of crimes, the pair were arrested and convicted of taking the lives of three separate people, one of them being Carla's own sister. See what I mean about them both being responsible for their own crimes? They both suck. The investigation into the crimes proved to be quite difficult, with authorities having plenty of hoops to jump through, and this is why a plea deal was created for Carla. She had one week to accept or decline the deal, which would give her a sentence of 12 years for her full cooperation. She accepted. Both were convicted in 2005, and Paul was up to apply for parole in 2018, and in October of that year, he was denied. His next parole hearing was just over a year ago, on June 22nd of 2021, and it took only an hour of deliberation to decide to turn down that application as well. I personally think 30 seconds probably would have been enough to decide, but I'm just glad the outcome was the same. Carla, on the other hand, served her 12 year sentence and then was released. Like, years ago. She moved away from Canada and headed to Costa Rica for a while with her new husband and children, if you can believe that, but unfortunately, she has since returned. In our number 3 spot today, we have Edmund Kemper. 
Edmund Kemper is an American killer who was convicted for taking the lives of 10 people, including his paternal grandparents as well as his own mother. It is said that he is noted for his height as he is 6 foot 9 inches and for his intelligence as he apparently has an IQ of 145, but I personally think he is most notable for being an absolute monster. His first crime took place when he took the lives of his grandparents, and after this crime he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and spent time in a hospital before it was determined that he was rehabilitated and he was released at the age of 21. After his release, he unfortunately went on a spree where he would target young females who were hitchhiking. After his final crimes, he ended up confessing and turning himself in, which is something we really don't see all of the time. When asked in an interview why he confessed, he said, quote, The original purpose was gone. It wasn't serving any physical or real or emotional purpose. It was just a pure waste of time. Three court-appointed psychiatrists examined and observed him and found him to be legally sane and thus he was able to stand trial. On November 8, 1973, the jury deliberated for just five hours before returning with a verdict of guilty. He has been eligible for parole since 1979 and has been denied every time he applied, one time saying, quote, society is not ready in any shape or form for me. I can't fault them for that. He is eligible to apply for parole again next in 2024. In our number two spot today, we have Stephen Griffiths. This is a person who is said to have idolized the Yorkshire Ripper, so I'm sure what comes next will be no surprise. Stephen was a PhD student who wanted to achieve fame, but through the most sinister way possible. Between June 2009 and May of 2010, he would go on to take the lives of three separate women. His criminal history was also extremely concerning, as years ago, he had been arrested due to an unprovoked attack on a grocery store manager, and it is said that he previously stated that he saw himself becoming a serial killer. Shortly after he was arrested for his crimes, CCTV footage emerged that shows him celebrating after taking the life of his final victim. The footage showed him holding up a crossbow and giving the finger directly to the camera. It is said that Stephen pled guilty to his crimes once caught, not because he was remorseful, but because he wanted to receive the recognition for them. In our number one spot today, we have Joanne. Denny. This is a person responsible for a series of killings and attacks that took place in March 2013. Joanna is a very cold and heartless person and has, on many occasions, been said to laugh at her crimes and the lives she took even still behind bars. After the first of her crimes, authorities launched a manhunt for her and they used CCTV footage to help track her down. She was finally caught after attacking two dog walkers who, thanks to immediate medical intervention, were able to survive. There are many things about this story that make it exceptionally chilling and it seems as though most people Joanna encounters are left with quite an impression of what a horrible person she is. On the day she was sentenced, it is reported that the judge, Mr. Justice Spencer, said, Quote, Although you pleaded guilty, you've made it clear you have no remorse. He went on to say, quote, You are a cruel, calculating, selfish, and manipulative serial killer. After this, he sentenced her to a whole life order or life in prison without parole, and it is said that she smiled and laughed at this. Since her time in prison, she is said to have planned escape attempts that involved the killing of a prison guard and other terrifying ideas. Kicking off the list at number 10, Aham Cardle. One of the worst of the worst when it comes to turkey serial killers. His nickname is Izmir the Monster. He sexually assaulted and then killed young women in the mid 80s. But once he was checked into a mental hospital, he was either released or he escaped multiple times. This guy did this multiple times. And then once he was out, he would then repeat said disgusting crimes. He would leave. I'll somebody horribly and then be sent back. It was a broken system that clearly was not working for anybody. He shouldn't have been released at any point, nor should he have been able to escape. But after an escape in 2000, he was caught and then something bizarre happened. I had to start this list off with this one. This is what happens when two evil humans cross paths. He was killed by somebody else on this list, who I'll mention later on. Yeah, we got a crazy one today. This is the darkest list I've ever done on this channel. Number nine. Aidan Kolak. Yeah, fair warning, this is a dark list. After that first one, you're probably like, okay, I see. Some dark history coming in hot. This Turkish serial killer is responsible for taking the lives of 11 women who were all between the ages of 68 and 95, older women. He was also responsible for six other crimes that were also against elderly women. Just a horrible theme going on here, it's disgusting. Now, down the road, he eventually did get caught for these horrendous crimes. He then got six death sentences as well as 40 years in prison. I mean, yeah, right? I would hope that's the case here. Make it 80 years. Sure, doesn't matter at this point. Point is, see you never, pal. Bye. 
Now, this was back in 1995 when he was first sentenced, but cut to 2004, death penalty in Turkey was abolished, which now meant that in May 2005, one Adnan Kolak was released from jail. His nickname is the Artvin Monster. Number eight. Hu Wanlin, who started his life in jail in the early 1990s, and he was there as a result of human trafficking charges. You would think once inside, prisoners would have a tough time continuing their practice, but not Hu Wanlin. No, he decided to try something new entirely. While in jail, he kicked off his own medical practice, and then in 1997, after a retrial, Hu was released from prison. Once released, Hu continued this medical practice that he had started behind bars, but I must remind you at this point, he's not a doctor. He was not a medical practitioner at all. He was just doing that in jail because you're just in jail. So for the next few years, who treated many people with this herbal remedy that actually contained sodium sulfate, which is very lethal. It is suspected that because of this, he ended up taking the lives of around 146 people. Who was arrested again in 1999 and then was sentenced to 15 years in prison for practicing medicine without a license. Then 15 years later, he was released on good behavior. Yep, I said on good behavior. Shortly after his release in 2014, it's believed that he was responsible for another death, this time of a 22 year old student. I believe people people can change to a certain degree. This type of stuff, I mean, you can't just risk having these people in public. It's not fair. 146 lives? Come on, man. Number seven. Lane's Angels of Death. When you think of a group of Australian nurses, normally you would be at ease. Well, not in this case. In the early 80s, the fourth largest medical facility in Vienna had over 2,000 staff members, including four nurses, Waltrid Wagner, Maria Gruber, Irene Ladoff, and Stefania Meyer, all nicknamed the Angels of Death. They were all responsible for taking the lives of 49 patients. That is disgusting. Wagner used doses of morphine. They were this disgusting squad of nurses. They all worked together and helped each other achieve horrible crimes. They couldn't keep their mouths shut about their wrongdoings though, so thankfully somebody overheard them talking about their latest crime at a bar one night, and then in February 1989, all four of them were arrested as they all confessed to the killings. Two of the four, Meyer and Gruber, they got lighter sentences out of the four. They got charged with manslaughter and were released a few years later. Cut to 2008, the other two, Wagner and Ladoff, they were also released, and they have since changed their name. Number six, Nikolai Zumagaliev. While some of these are prisoners who were released and then are now out possibly in your neighborhood, there's also cases like Nikolai, where a prisoner is released and then they immediately go back for horrible crimes and then they stay there, thankfully, hopefully. Back in 1979, Nikolai killed a woman midday in the streets of Kazakhstan. When he was arrested, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and subsequently given a lighter sentence after the fact. He got manslaughter, so then a year later, he was released back into said streets of Kazakhstan. After this point, it's no surprise that he continued to kill others. And in 1980, he invited a group of friends over and then began going absolutely nuts and he took the life of one of them that day while everybody else ran out of the house. At that point, they arrested him and took him to a high security mental clinic. Thankfully, that's where he'll remain for life. Again, hopefully, but as we see on this list, things could change. Number five. Cybran Louis Van Schoor. Just sounds like trouble right off the bat. That many names? Can't be good. Back in 1992, Louis was a security guard in Cape Town, South Africa. He's now known as one of the worst serial killers in all of South Africa, in all of history. It's pretty bad stuff. See, Louis would respond to silent alarms that were triggered on business grounds. He was a security guard. But instead of arriving and, you know, handling the situation in any way that's normal, the former policeman would instantly just shoot to kill. No questions asked. That was it. He was convicted of killing 39 burglars. The families of the victims spoke up. This was, of course, lawless. This was cruel. So Louis was found guilty of seven murders and two attempted. 12 years later, in 2004, Louis was released. Yep, could have seen that one coming, could you? During a press conference, Louis said to the families and friends of my victims, I apologize if my actions caused any hurt and discomfort. I like how he says if. Okay. I have done my time. Yeah, you actually didn't do your time, Louis. You did 12 out of 20. Your math is and so are you. Number four, Ali Kaya. Nicknamed the baby-faced killer, Ali Kaya was convicted of 10 killings, but in 2012, the man was released after a report stated that he had a mental disorder. Common theme in this list here. His next step at this point is perhaps everybody's worst nightmare. He immediately attacked those who had testified against him during his previous trial. He ended up taking the lives of three of those people and leaving two more injured. That's terrifying. He was recaptured, thankfully, in 2013. Thankfully, nobody else got hurt after his initial release. But remember that horrible guy that I mentioned at the very beginning of this list, Aham Cardle? Well, when he was finally put back in that mental facility after escaping and killing over and over, this is the guy that ended up taking his life in jail. Yeah, Ali Kaya killed Aham Cartel in jail in 2000. Small world, huh? 
guess it's all about who you know. Number three, Charlene Gallego. A match made in hell, it seems, this time around. Back in the late 70s, Charlene Gallego, alongside her twisted husband, Gerald, were the worst in Sacramento, California. They kidnapped and then later killed 10 victims. They kept them and abused them for a while before ultimately ending their life in a cruel way. It was really the most twisted situation you can imagine. Just absolutely disgusting people. Now, cut to 1984, Charlene pleads guilty to murder and receives 16 years. Gerald was waiting for execution at this point, but he died of cancer before meeting his demise. <laughs> no comment. Charlene ended up getting out and moved to Fair Oaks, California, where she then changed her name and could be at the grocery store next to you. Number two, Anthony Montwheeler. On January 9th, 2017, Anthony kidnapped and subsequently took the life of his ex-wife, Anita Harmon, in front of multiple witnesses. Disgusting. Now, after this horrible crime, he took police on a short high-speed chase, which sadly ended in a head-on collision between him and another vehicle, which also took the life of the driver of that vehicle, David Bates. Just the wrong place at the wrong time. Horrible stuff, right? Now, cut to 20 years prior. We're gonna go back a little bit in 1996. It was at this time Anthony had been charged with kidnapping previous wife and their son at gunpoint, but during the trial, Anthony pled not guilty by reason of insanity, and he ended up having to avoid prison entirely, but was sentenced to remain under state jurisdiction for the maximum sentence, which at that time was 70 years. So for 20 years, he was held in a mental health facility, but 20 years is certainly not the 70, right? So how was he able to get out and commit these horrible crimes, you ask? Well, in late 2016, quite recently, just one month before these horrible other crimes unfolded, that I started with, he sat in front of a state review board and admitted to them that he had been faking insanity the entire time after that long. He detailed about how he studied books on how people would behave and how his previous defense of hearing the voice of his late mother was entirely just made up. He even said, I've been using the system and just, I'm done. Yeah, he just got tired of playing along with his own charade. Although a forensic psychologist found him to be a high risk offender, a psychiatrist from the facility that he stayed at testified that he showed no signs of mental illness and had been off medications for a year. This would make sense considering he's admitting to no mental illness, but does that mean that he's not a high risk individual? He ended up being released from the facility and the guy didn't even have to serve a prison sentence. And then this is what led him to ultimately being able to unfortunately commit these atrocious acts on January 9th, 2017, that head on collision. Number one. Carla Homoka. Being a Canadian, it's hard not to end on such a grim personal note here. In the early 90s, Carla Homoka and her husband, Paul Bernardo, they had done horrible things to at least three women. They killed three women, one of which was Carla's sister, Tammy. Horrible stuff. See, Carla had offered her own sister as some sort of gift to Paul. How disgusting and crazy is that? So when Bernardo was arrested in 1993, that's when Carla told officials that she was actually forced to be involved in said killings. Although later footage that was released would determine otherwise. She wasn't necessarily on board. Apparently she was forced to comply. Okay, sure. So with that, she got a plea deal for testifying against Paul, therefore receiving 12 years. Cut to 2007, she's out. Now she has two kids, she's fully remarried, and she even volunteers with other parents at a school in Montreal. One woman spoke out, as I'm sure many do on a daily basis, but she said to breakfast television on air, we don't want her here. How would you feel knowing that your child is interacting with a person who is a serial killer? It's not right. I have to agree. What are your thoughts on this whole situation? Sound off below. I mean, I personally wouldn't be in the same town as Carla Homoka, if I'm being honest. If I'm being honest, Toronto is too close for comfort. Like, I'm gonna go move more west. Starting off this countdown, we have Nikolai Zumagaliev. This guy is so evil that it's hard to believe what he did was real. So Nikolai is a Soviet serial killer who took the lives of at least 10 people in the 1980s. He would target women and would often ax them to death, after in which he would eat them. In fact, he was given the name Metal Fang because he had false teeth made from white metal. That way, it was easier for him to be able to eat into the flesh. In the late 1980s, he was caught after having one of his friends over, and the friend found a human head and intestines inside of his fridge. After that, he was arrested and tried but declared insane. In 1989, when he was transported to another facility, Nikolai actually escaped and was on the run for two years. Thankfully, he was caught and re-institutionalized. But in December of 2016, he escaped again, but officials refused to confirm the claim. Either way, be careful around this guy, like he might try and escape for the third time. Moving on to number nine, we have Alan Leger. Alan Leger is a Canadian serial killer who on June 21st of 1986, entered a convenience store in Black River Bridge, New Brunswick with two other accomplices and robbed the joint. While doing so, they beat the store owner to death, but they were later caught and arrested. He was given a life sentence and sent to prison. However, in 1989, he managed to escape and was on the run for seven months. During this time, he killed four more innocent people. 
He also committed arson and a list of other crimes as well. Eventually, he was recaptured and is now spending the rest of his life in Canada's Maximum Security Special Handling Unit. Moving on to number eight, we have Rodney Halbauer. Ever since Rodney was young, he has been committing crimes. It started when he was only 16 years old. During his younger years, he was arrested and released on parole a number of times. But when released, he would commit more crimes, like theft. In 1975, Rodney was released on bail after taking advantage of a Las Vegas blackjack dealer. But while on bail, he took advantage of and killed six other women and received a life sentence. However, in 1977, he actually escaped jail and kidnapped his own daughter. Shortly after, he was recaptured only to escape again in 1986. While on the run, he stabbed and injured another woman. Thankfully, once again, he was recaptured. Wouldn't you think after the first time they would keep a closer eye on him? I guess not. In our seventh spot, we have Thomas Silverstein. Now this dude is said to be one of the most dangerous prisoners of all time and the most violent prisoner in America. He was first jailed in 1978 for armed robbery. While in jail, he killed a prison officer and two inmates. He also was the leader for the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang for quite some time. This prison gang is the largest and deadliest prison gang in the US with an estimated 20,000 members inside the prison and on the streets. Because of how many people he killed and injured in prison, Silverstein got transferred to a federal prison in Atlanta. There, he was confined in a six by seven foot cell. He was under 24 hour surveillance. In fact, the lights in his cell were never turned off so that they could always watch him. Silverstein eventually died in prison at the age of 67. In our sixth spot today, we have Victor Figueroa. On February 6th, 1997, Victor Figueroa managed to escape a Moroa shock incarceration facility in Mineville, New York. Victor had been serving a one to four year sentence for drug possession, but decided to take his chances and flee. When authorities noticed that he was missing, they searched the area, but all the leads ran cold. He has not been seen or heard from since. In fact, he's the only New York state prison inmate to escape and never be found. Either he's still out there or he died while trying to escape. Either way, it's a bit scary thinking that he could potentially still be out there. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with James Eddie Diggs. To the public, James Eddie Diggs seemed like a top-notch citizen. He seemed to be a great family man with a happy wife and two young sons. However, in the morning of May 26, 1949, he shot and killed his wife and kids before disappearing forever. Police did manage to find him a week later, but he managed to escape the officer by shooting him in the face and killing him. He since fled into the woods and hasn't been caught since. In fact, he was one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives for the longest time, but he was eventually removed from the list in 1961 and is said to be dead by now. In our fourth spot, we have Robert Mon Maudsley. Robert Maudsley is considered Britain's most dangerous prisoner, and you're about to find out why! In 1974, Maudsley was arrested for taking advantage of young individuals. But during his trial, he was found unfit and was sent to Broadmoor Hospital instead of a prison. While there, Maudsley and another patient locked themselves in a cell with another patient and held him hostage. While there, they tortured him to death over a period of nine hours. After this incident, he was convicted of manslaughter and was sent to Wakefield Prison. And there, he killed three inmates, after which he got placed in solitary confinement and spends his life in a glass cell underneath Wakefield Jail. In our third spot, we have George Edward Wright. In 1962, George Edward Wright was convicted for murder and was sentenced to up to 30 years in prison. Wright and three other men went on a spree of armed robbery, one in which they shot a man and took off with his money, which was only $70, so was it really worth it? Anyways, they were caught and put into jail. But then in 1970, Wright managed to escape from a prison in New Jersey. He was caught and locked up once again, only to escape once more in 1972. This time, he made sure he was never going to be caught again. So he came up with a plan. This plan involved hijacking a Delta Airlines flight and collecting ransom for the release of the passengers. Upon doing so, they flew the plane to Portugal. In 2011, the police caught up with him in Portugal, but since Portugal has no extradition treaty with the United States, Wright was released remains a fugitive to this day. Coming in at number two, we have Eric Rudolph. In 1996, Eric Rudolph bombed Atlanta's Centennial Olympic Park during the summer games. As a result, two individuals were killed and over 100 were injured. But that was just the beginning of his deadly bombing spree. He pulled off three more bombings, injuring hundreds more. For five years, the police were on a hunt for Eric. 
At one point, he was one of the top 10 fugitives on the FBI's list. It wasn't until 2003 that Eric got arrested. Turns out that he was hiding in the mountains for five years. Being a skilled outdoorsman, this helped him greatly. When he was caught, he pled guilty to all four bombings and was given four life sentences without the possibility of parole. He's now spending the rest of his life in the super prison in Florence, Colorado. And in our number one spot today, we have Santiago Maduros. In 2010, Santiago fired into a random person's car because one of the passengers was wearing the wrong color jacket. The victim had no ties to any gang. He was just an innocent person riding in his sister's car. He was severely injured and his sister was unfortunately killed. A couple weeks later, Santiago and some of his friends were robbing a car. And when a group of men tried to stop them, he shot at them as well. He killed a random person that was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. From there, he was on the run for about a decade. He was finally caught in 2020 in Mexico.